sales class, which is building and managing professional sales organizations, was started eight years ago, nine years ago, by uh, Jim Latin, who many of you probably remember from the GSB, and Mark Leslie, uh, another person that's been around the campus for quite some time. They started teaching that class, like I said, I think it was eight or nine years ago, one section, 35 students. We now teach four sections. They're more or less filled up at 60 to 65. So there's demand for this content, and it kind of makes sense, right? If you think about as CEOs, op entrepreneurs, you look at your P&L, and there's that big line item for, for sales, and then you think back, <laughs> about, think back uh, to your curriculum at the GSB, and you, know, you had four finance classes and six marketing classes, and maybe if you were lucky for the six of you that took the sales class, you got to address that one function that seems to account in many businesses for 30, 40, 50 percent of your, of your expenses. So what we try to do in the Stanford class is take some of the mystery out of it and turn it from a black box into something that's a little bit more structured, put a little more science behind it, and, and try to take some of the, uh, the mythology that surrounds sales um, out of it. So, in five minutes, or 10 maybe, I'm going to try to paint a picture of how to think about uh, building a go-to-market model, building a sales org, and I've tried to organize these topics from most strategic to, to, to increasingly tactical or operational. And I sit on a handful of, of private boards, and I help with uh, Excel partners from, on the venture side. And point number one, I think, is the biggest challenge I think companies really face with, as, it, as it relates to sales orgs and sales productivity, which is they look at the sales organization's lack of productivity, and they don't really recognize the real challenge they have is they haven't really achieved product market fit. And you see this all the time in private venture-backed companies. Um, where companies start to expand their sales organization before they have real product market fit. So I would say this is the number one source of low sales productivity. Uh, and like I said, the common error is scaling sales before you truly have product market fit. One, I'll just throw out there one proxy that I like to look at for private stage companies in terms of just getting a gut feel for whether they've achieved product market fit is if the majority of their sales reps have achieved their quota for at least two quarters, right? I see, I see this all the time. A, a company might have a handful of salespeople. On average, they're making their quota, right? But what that really means is one person knocked it out of the park and everybody else is falling short. And that law of averages doesn't work very well. And so, they, so companies interpret that as, as repeatability and product market fit, and they start pouring money into the sales organization. They burn a ton of cash, turn over a bunch of salespeople and that cycle begins. Therefore, you need to go raise more money, on and on. Um, so a second important, again, kind of more strategic question is, is clear segmentation. This is that whole kind of rifle shot versus shotgun approach. Do you have a focus in who, in, in who you're targeting? Uh, and I, I think from a sales go-to-market perspective, you should have a very clear coverage model. In other words, who sells what to whom. As your company gets larger, and you might have inside sales and feed, field sales and channels, having clear, a clear coverage model, a coverage map of who's, do, who's selling what to whom is, is super important. We spend a bunch of time on that in the GSB class. Uh, and then, you know, the go-to-market model, this is not an a la carte menu. I think that who you sell to, what you sell, what your value proposition largely determines whether you're going to go direct, you're going to go through OEMs, whether you're going to go through resellers, what type of resellers, or have some kind of hybrid model. Right? And again, having some understanding of, of what the pros and cons of those, of those fundamental go-to-market structures uh, mean is super important. Uh, and then the sales model economics. Given who you're selling to, what you're selling, what your value proposition is, your chosen go-to-market, can you foresee some years out actually the economics working out, right? It, there are many circumstances, and I see this often, where the go-to-market model required to sell whatever product and service you're selling will never make sense economically. 
And, and typically this comes where the product requires a lot of heavy lifting. It's a big ticket evangelical sell to a lot of, uh, to bigger companies, multifunctional, uh, uh, multifunctional decision making. And the price point's too low, the sales cycle's too long. Again, we're kind of back to product market fit again. Uh, kind of classic problem. So can you make any money doing this? Or at least can you grow fast enough? Because you don't actually have to make money, do you? Is that an old-fashioned notion? <laughs> I, I put and make money up there, and I thought, God, you sound so old. I think you have to make money. So those decisions in red then drive these decisions in blue. Who are you going to hire? What's the hiring profile? Right? What's your, what's your organization structure? You know, if you're a SaaS business today, everybody defaults to this organization structure around SDRs and then sales reps and customer success people. And you have channel managers and you have SDR managers and sales managers and pretty soon you get 12 people taking a bite of every deal. You know, back in the good old days, this is B2B, not B2C, we would sell software to the end customer. They would pay us all up front. If they wanted post-sales hand-holding, we would charge for it. Imagine that, right? Sales reps found and killed their own deals. So no SDRs. Economics looked fantastic. Now fast forward to today, you got an SDR pound, pounding the phones or emails spamming all of our prospects. If they find something that's lukewarm, they pass it to a sales rep. They close the deal. The sales rep passes it over to a customer success person. Kirk, do you want to tell people what SDRs are? Oh, uh, sales development reps. Prospectors. Usually young, hungry, inexperienced, cheap. So that's the model du jour. And sometimes it really works. The problem is it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And so if you're in a SaaS business today, people just kind of adopt this model without thinking through first principles. And they find themselves upside down and, and for obvious reasons. So while I'm a big, a big fan in certain circumstances of all the things I just talked about, you have to be careful not to just absorb what everybody else is doing as your, as your org structure and your go-to-market model. You need some first principle thinking around these things. Uh, again, starting to get a little bit more tactical, uh, all of the rest of it kind of falls apart if you don't get some of this operational stuff down. Uh, so you have to make decisions around territory definition, right? Uh, how do you rebalance territories when you add new reps? This is a great problem to have because it generally means you're growing, right? But you know, the, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it mer in a meritocratic way where everybody has equal opportunity and maybe the best salesperson win, or you know, kind of the way a lot of the older school companies do it, which is whoever's in first and uh, closes a deal hangs on to it forever. So the new reps come in and you know, they get Gilroy as a territory and the old reps get San Francisco and they wonder why the new reps never succeed, right? So, so there's some cultural ramifications to these decisions. You have to make compensation plan decisions. We talk a ton about this in, in the GSB class needs to be a three by five. If, it, if it's too complicated to fit on a three by five card, you're over-engineering it, right? And, and this is one of my favorite topics because, you know, as analytical MBAs, everybody wants to create the master comp plan that micromanages the activities of this very complex and expensive sales organization. Uh, and in some ways, that's just a crutch for not managing through a, a number of things that should be managed through. Forecasting, one of my favorite topics. You guys love forecasting, right? So can you forecast your business 90 days out, plus or minus low single digits? Who can, who can do that in here? Yeah, a few people? Are your businesses tra more transactional in nature or a bigger ticket? Bigger, bigger ticket, and you can predict. So we, we should talk, right? Because it's the selling bigger ticket B2B software and being able to forecast your business plus or minus single digit 90 days out is, is very unusual. It's also a requirement if you want to go public, 
right? And the percentage of companies that actually go public, again, my background is, is, is B2B. For those of you that are in the B2C business, I apologize. But in the B2B space, if you look at the track record of companies that go public and then how many quarters they go before they miss because they can't forecast their business, it's a pretty high percentage, shockingly high percentage. It's hard, it's hard but not impossible to do. But it's also forecasting is not a reporting process if done correctly. It's, it's a management, it's a way to manage activities and results. It's a way to manage an organization. It's not just a reporting function. And again, we spend a ton of time on that in the, in the GSB class. Uh, performance management, this is another great topic. Um, this idea of, of performance plans, improvement plans, performance improvement plans, what's the HR acronym of the day? PIP plans, performance <laughs> improvement plans, is that what we do now? Right, we, we look at sales organizations, if you're not performing, we put you on a performance improvement plan. I'm telling you, I never did that. I never did that, because I think it's lazy management, right? Performance management is about setting expectations early and, and then, uh, let me back up. I would argue that the right way to do performance management is, is to give everybody a plan on day one, but it's not a performance improvement plan. It's a quick start plan that everybody signs up to, the, the, the individual contributor, the individual contributor's manager. Everybody agrees to what success looks like over the next 90 days. And then you track that over the next 90 days, and if it doesn't work out, then it's time to move someone out. Rather than this retrospective look, put someone on a plan to cover your ass as HR, which I think is kind of a um, disingenuous way to manage people. Uh, and then development, right? Skills, training, and development. Too many sales organizations think training is a one-week onboarding class and then you know, death by PowerPoint from the product marketing organization uh, you know, once a quarter when they come in and have a few beers and watch these slideshows. That's not training, that's not skills development. Uh, I was noticing that, um, well, I'll come back to this. One of my first companies that I worked for, to make your way up the management chain, you had to take a, a side detour in many cases and become a trainer, right? A sales trainer. And that basically meant, and by the way, there was no compensation bump. So if you were a sales rep and you wanted to go to that first level management job, you're making three, four, five hundred grand a year. You get to take a sales training job, pays about 150, and you're gonna go live on a plane for a year. And you're going to basically take your best practices and go on hundreds or thousands of sales calls with the rest of the sales organization trying to inculcate them with what made you successful. And if that all goes well, you get a management job, right? It's fantastic. It worked fantastically. Uh, but that's how seriously that company took it. Whereas other companies, you know, the sales trainers tend to be the people that didn't make it in sales or didn't make it in marketing or didn't make it in biz dev, which is kind of the graveyard for salespeople, right? So how seriously do you as an organization take development of skills and training your salespeople? Not only as a way to make their productivity better, but also as a retention device, right? So there's a, I noticed this uh, the other day on, on LinkedIn, there's a company in the Bay Area called uh, MongoDB. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know this company? So that, that sales organization is essentially the, the children and stepchildren of this company that I just described. And the CEO's on LinkedIn talking about how they're hiring and the headline is all about how they're gonna, they're gonna develop you as salespeople and sales managers to be the best in the industry, that this is where you get your essentially sales MBA. And I thought, you know, God, it's so rare to see that. What a fantastic differentiator for a company trying to hire the best and the brightest in, in sales. I thought that was super smart. But when I looked at the lineage of the people, they're all, like I said, sons, daughters, cousins of, uh, of people from this company that, uh, that I was fortunate enough to work for in my early career. So that's kind of big picture down to more uh, 
tactical execution oriented topics. So I'm going to pull Lucas in here. I'm going to ask him a real world question that I think came from someone in the, in the, in the community here. And then he's going to pose a question to me and then we're going to open it up and try to solve some real world problems. Right? So this question uh, from one of the attendees was, I've just taken over my company and we have two salespeople who report to me. I'm the CEO. I think we can have 10 salespeople in two years and grow a lot more after that. Should I be looking for a director of sales or a VP or what? Right? By the way, this is a, a super common question I get from former students who yeah. are out uh, building and buying companies. And it's Lucas. A, it's a super common question I get from new operators. Um, and the answer might be a little controversial, but I'm going to say neither. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, goes to a little bit of what Kurt was saying before, which is uh, uh, increasingly in this form of entrepreneurship, sales is, is the highest, and, uh, highest order task to get good at to ensure success. It used to be that search funds were uh, uh, for smaller LBOs. And I think what we've seen over time is, yes, you still are using financial engineering to generate returns on 5 to 10% top line growth. But the mo most successful outcomes for search fund entrepreneurs are where they've bought into situations where they can learn to how to do their version of sales well and get to 15, 20, 25% growth organically, repeatably over time. And then you, know, you get the boost of the leverage, but your return is generated mainly by how good you get at selling what you sell. Um, and as a search fund entrepreneur, you're never going to learn that up front if you hire someone else immediately. It's up to you to get in there and ask yourself, how do I sell and to whom should I be selling? And that takes longer than two years and arguably some of us are still learning how to do that. But, and it evolves as you evolve as a business. So I think the onus is on you as the, as the entrepreneur. To, 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 to take over that function, to work with those two people to say, is, am I in a service that's bought or sold? And if it's bought, that means one thing. And if it's sold, that means another in terms of how you organize. What should the go to, I understand what the go to market is now. Clearly that got you a little bit of success, but it's definitely not what's going to get you to where you want to be. So what should that go to market be? And then start thinking about who that leader is. And then you ask yourself, do I want a director or a, a, a VP? And I think that decision is more driven based on where you think your company is in its evolution. Um, one of my main takeaways from the sales class um, at, at the business school, and I think I was in maybe the first or the second year it was taught, was um, in hiring a VP of sales, you are hiring that person's sales model. They will come in and sell how they know how to sell. And so I think that it, that should inform you as an entrepreneur that you need to understand what you think the answer to how you should sell is before you're ready to hire that person. So uh, in my specific case, uh, on -ramp, literally on ramp had two salespeople. <laughs> um, they, as far as I could tell, they were basically just picking up the phone, which was a, is a gr not. I don't mean picking up and call, I'm sorry, it's more passive. They were answering the phone when it rang, which generally means you're in a good industry. Um, uh, and, and over time, we've had to learn this. We didn't hire a VP of sales until we were four years in. I didn't hire a director before. And it's the best time I've spent in the business in terms of really being able to create scale to grow this thing. So my question for you is another question that was asked by the group, which is, I think, a little bit further along the evolution. Um, so I, I, and the situation is such, I've, I've, I've I have a couple reps. I think I, know, I think I know how we sell. I think we're along the path. We're seeing progress. How do I build a culture of a high-performing high sales team? Yeah, so a high-performance sales team, if I were to quantify it, means, means what? Highly productive, probably. So there's no silver bullet, right? I think if you want a high-performance sales team, you have to you basically have to nail all of these. You can't, if, if you don't have great product market fit, I'll start at the top, it doesn't matter who you hire, right? I've seen great organizations selling low value proposition products and the result is low productivity. 
non-high performance sales organizations. If you were to transplant that sales organization into a company that had better product market fit, a stronger value proposition, they, they might be fantastically productive. So that's where it, that's where it starts. I was fortunate along the way to work for uh, VMware. I was the VP of sales there for a while. And, you know, I guess we're being recorded, so I'll watch what I say. But maybe the most dysfunctional management team I've ever been a part of, and we crushed it, right? Perhaps because product market fit was so incredibly high, mm -hmm. right? And I've been part of organizations that were incredibly functional, where the value proposition was not so strong, and it was like pushing a rock up a hill every single day. You've been there, right? You know what the difference is. You know what it feels like when there's pull from the market. And what you're, you can see it in the eyes of the prospects and the buyers, right? They get excited about what you're selling. The value proposition is, just resonates so strongly that you're rolling rocks down the hill. I was on the board of Atlassian, great example of a company that everybody loves their products and they have such a great competitive differentiation uh, that there's a ton of pull uh, and that makes everybody's life easier. And I imagine we've all kind of been in those scenarios where everything feels like a boulder being pushed uphill. And that's generally a function of the first one. Uh, uh, although, even if you have that, you have to nail the rest of this if you really want to knock it out of the park. So it's a long answer to a short question. So let's open it up. Let's, uh, let's try to solve some real questions. Um, uh -oh. Lucas, uh, when you uh, talked about hiring the director of VP for three, four years, uh, is that role purely a managerial role, or is it a player coach? And, and do you think that that role has to be a, either one or the, or the other? I think it's, it's situation <clears throat> specific. Um, we hired a, a pure manager, but there's no, in sales, there's no such thing as a pure manager. I, as CEO of the business, I'm, I'm like actively selling all of our biggest deals. So it's not, I don't, I don't carry a bag, for, well, I carry the bag of the P&L, but I don't carry, a, I don't, it's not going to impact a quota that I have. Um, and so the person we hired, um, his goal was to, 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 to systematize and, and, and really drive that next phase of growth with both systems and processes and with um, uh, the recruitment of good people. But he was actively in the room on all the biggest deals. He or she, uh, he or she is quote, he, his quota is a roll up of all the individual quotas minus 10% um, into perpetuity. <laughs> and his variable comp is his total comp, variable comp is a very high component of his total comp. A, a pretty uh, tactical question, which is, I, I think, an age-old or perennial problem with a sales force on commission, <coughs> where the commission continues as long as the customer keeps buying. Um, the dilemma really is, in our experience, people get to a comfort level and of the existing book of business and how do you manage that uh, balance of focus to, hey, we want new business, you know, this is all great, but we need your time focused on new business. And the simple answer, of course, is compensation, but even when we've kind of skewed comp dramatically commission rates towards new business, there's still a kind of phenomenon where folks get a little fat and happy and it's really hard to motivate them to put the time into prospecting and new business. I think you started down the path to answer your own question, yeah. right? So it's about, it's about focus. So what would be the next step beyond increasing the commission rates for new versus existing business? What's the logical next step? I guess some non-financial performance metrics to try and drive the... How about exactly. just separating the organization and having a set of people that just does... Um, Your business is triggered to business. repeat revenue, not recurring, correct? Uh, it's repeat, although some of it's reasonably contractual, <coughs> repeat, repeat revenue. And, and, and we've tried that, but then you walked straight into another dilemma, which is, hey, Fred, 
is the one that sold me. Fred, in fact, was a large part of the reason that I chose to do business with you. Where did Fred go? So let me ask you, your product, you're saying your relationship with the customer is so sensitive that if you pull your sales rep, you risk the business? So in other words, they're really not buying the product or the service. The value proposition is such that it's more about who sold it to them? Uh, partly, because the role is partly coordinating new projects and, and there's some um, you know, a degree of effectiveness required to be have a comfort level that the next project is going to go smoothly. What's the product or service you're selling? Um, boy, uh, out-of-home advertising projects, so, so big production to, to kit out a whole airport. Yeah. So there, you have a few different levers here, and I, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. You can change commission rates for where you want people to focus. You're saying that doesn't necessarily work all that well. The next logical step is you segment people between selling new business, so they wake up on a rainy Monday and that's all they focus on, right? And then folks that are essentially managing the existing book of business. The third thing you, want to, you can do if you want to keep people both selling new and managing old is you need to keep redistributing territory so that the only way for them to reach their goals is to do both. So rather than uh, holding on to every deal they ever closed infinitum, right, you just have to keep rebalancing like, like you would your, your investment portfolio at the end of every quarter or at the end of every year. So those are kind of the levers you have to deal with. And the fourth one is management, which is, you know, I would talk to my sales organization every Monday morning and things that I thought import, were important weren't always in the comp plan. And, and so you can manage pretty aggressively to other measures as well if you want. So th those are the levers you have. Can I, can I put that into search fund context for a little bit? That's all true. I agree with all that. The single, the, most of you, if you're uh, within the first three years of your operating experience, will be faced with this decision. And it will seem, it, it seems hard. Um, and different businesses are aligned differently, but the reality is if you're it, most of us are buying contractually recurring revenue businesses. And um, see, this, I would just say it this way, one of the biggest drivers of success we had at OnRamp was separating the two, creating that focus. Um, uh, and, and getting our best people on the highest priority buckets within both of those. If you give a salesperson more than one thing to do, and he knows that the easier thing will get him to his goal each time. He will do the easier thing. And rarely is the easier thing the thing will lead, that will lead to longer term growth for your business. Hey, uh, Lucas, can you talk about how you work through some of the product market fit in the early days? Were there certain segments that you just, you were still getting some deals and you said no to because. I know. wish it were that. I mean, we. You're, grow, you're trying to grow as fast as you can. You, feel, you know, to a certain extent, our product development was in the early days was the result of our sales guys going out and selling things that we couldn't exactly do that way at the beginning, which is a familiar, probably a familiar strain for a lot of you. For a lot of you, um, uh, for us, it was about figuring out what we are good at and only focusing on that. So when we bought OnRamp, we bought a portfolio of four different business models. We were a pure play co-location player. We were a, a manage a man. A, dedicated hosting player calling ourselves a managed hosting player. We were a subscale ISP and we were like an application development job shop. And over time, we realized we, sh we shed, totally shut those, shut the revenue down on the golf hard, shut the revenue down on two of those and just focused on pure play co-location and, and developing enterprise class private cloud business and then the hybrid that comes with that. So for us, it was, much, it was less about um, sort of evidence that one was selling or another and more about strategically where we wanted to be and define ourselves in the market. Is that, that's probably not a very satisfying version of that. Sorry. Can you tell us about some of the unique lessons you've learned with selling higher dollar value contracts, 100K plus? Under, sorry. Over 100K, 100K plus. In the MRR or annual? ACV. Annual contract value. Got it. You have many of those? Yeah, but this is, this is your, your, you, Haas. <laughs> so narrow it down a little bit. I mean, that's a broad question. So 
So um, let's say how you manage sales staffing given that a $100,000 plus deal probably requires a longer sales cycle. So you probably had to dedicate more resources on prospecting and focusing on getting to the right decision maker and closing the deal ahead of being able to collect the cash. For sure, right? So this is, you know, in the venture business, we've, it, it, be, it was pretty unfashionable for a while to do these, these big ticket B2B companies. And still to some degree, it's not as sexy as doing the next Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever, right? For exactly this reason, which is, as the ticket prices get bigger, but price is generally a proxy for other complexity, right? So if you're selling SAP, for example, you're having to convince multiple functions within the organization to buy into this thing, right? So the complex, price is a proxy for complexity. Uh, it's often a proxy for the, uh, how business critical or business important the product or service is. So again, scrutiny gets higher. As price tag goes up, you know, the approval cycles and the internal ROI justifications get harder. So that's all true, right? Um, and so you invest all this money in, in expensive salespeople to go execute that go-to-market model. And you start getting upside down on cash pretty, pretty quickly. So that's, I think, one of the reasons these, these big ticket B2B companies kind of fell out of favor and everybody wants a, a smoother, more transactional way, you know, land and expand instead of top down in order to make the economics work. The fact of the matter is, is, is all, of, all of those building blocks on there have to be addressed in the context of a big ticket sale. So who you hire is going to be different, right? Um, how you forecast the business is going to be different. One of the critical errors I think companies make is they don't look at leading indicators of the business in long sales cycles. So, you know, they wait nine months, the deal doesn't materialize, and they've burned all this cash, and they don't know why it didn't happen, right? So the forecasting process has to move from what are you going to close this week to how are you going to move from the qualification stage to the validation stage? And what are the entry and exit criteria for each of those stages? And can we validate it and verify it and make sure and get comfortable that we're pouring this money into this, this cash into this go-to-market bucket, we have to get comfortable that something's going to come out the other end, and we can't wait and end up with a goose egg, right? So forecasting has to change. Like I said, people have to change. How you manage it has to change. Um, your capital structure has to change. You know, you got to raise more money. There's, there's a bunch of things that go into that. So hard to narrow it down to one particular lesson or not. Yeah, Harrison? Can you talk about hiring new salespeople? De novo. So let's say you're a CEO, a search front company. Let's say you're not in Silicon Valley software. There's like five cops right nearby, and yeah. you know the other CEOs, right? So you're out there, and you haven't delegated to some director of sales. You're you're hiring fresh guys and gals, and you want to have better than the average success, lower than the average turnover. How do you figure out who's going to succeed? Are you guys believers in you know the personality testing kind of model? Like, how do you figure out who's going to work? I'll give my opinion. I think it's a great question. And then Lucas, why don't you, you, go, you, why don't you pile in? The, I always start from the perspective, if I can, don't hire strangers. All right? So for critical jobs, the way, you, the way you increase your batting average is you hire people you absolutely know are, are, are performers. Uh, and, and, and so I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't spend enough time working their own network before they default to hiring a recruiter. And a recruiter is lowest common denominator in many cases for hiring any position, but salespeople in particular. Mm -hmm. you know, I referenced this company I started to work for, Parametric, back in the day. Um, we got to half a billion in revenue before we ever used a recruiter, right? And so we, now arguably maybe a little, a little later than we needed to, but everything was exaggerated to make a point in that company. But the idea was <laughs> we forced management to exercise their network to find people now, we became a little bit too homogeneous, I think, so there's downsides to that. But the lesson is, is that our hit rate in terms of hiring people that made it and succeeded was much higher because great salespeople know great salespeople. So that's one place I would start. Um, so relying on much, much more in that way. Yeah. Is that really, does that ever happen? You tell me that some GSB grad doesn't have a network? 
it's, yeah, I, I struggle with that. I just don't think, you might have to work harder, but I don't think there's anybody in this room but to, who doesn't to be, have a network. To be fair, the GSP network is like, I know a bunch of people in hedge no, funds. I, and listen, I don't, well, come on. You, uh, how old are you now, Lucas? I'm, I'm old enough. <laughs> <laughs> now you, I'm assuming you made some friends along the way, right? Yeah, but, but I, uh, I'm just, I'm just yeah. the, 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 it's a valid concern. I'm not saying it's the GSB network specifically. Got it, it might be. Got it. But we collectively have uh, a, a huge network to mine, right? So that's where I would start. I, I can add, I'll add my, a couple of comments. Um, I fully agree about the recruiters. I think it's, and I fully agree. Our best salespeople come from people that we know are good and they say they're good. So I fully agree with that. But you're not going to have that up front. Um, a first heuristic for me is never hire a salesperson that doesn't already have a job. And there's lots of them. And they're between jobs. And whatever they tell you about why they're between jobs is probably not true. Because as a CEO of a business, I am never letting my good salespeople go. I'm going to do whatever it takes to retain them. So that's a good heuristic. The second thing I generally say is you, it's a constant process of testing and learning. I would not run towards process. Like, I would not run towards a personality test at the beginning until you've done some failing. And you know everyone's going to fail on this. But um, it, 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 it took a while for, us to, for me to understand. My first crack at it was I sat down and I said, what are the qualities I want in this person? What are the questions I can get to? get to ask to get there. And then over time, it evolves, and you sort of you see. And then about three years in, we put in a process where we were able to go. Um, it, we have, it's like a personality test, but um, we were able to go and have all of our Salesforce take it first. And so we were able to see how they scored. And we, we could say, these were the people we like and the people we want to hire. And then from an informed perspective, we can we can do that. But I wouldn't rush towards a process until you have a better sense of what's going to be successful or not. So Harris, you know, look satisfied with that answer. So I just know how what's hard it is in practice, you know, to, when you can't find people that you know or somebody yeah. you know you know, sometimes it does feel like you're just, you know, grabbing almost at random based on good interview skills. But everyone, every one of us that's done a search fund in here has, definitionally has high emotional EQ because you've convinced smart, wealthy people to invest in you, right? And that's worth something. You can sit in a room and tell that this person's a total clown face <laughs> most of the time. You're not going to get it right all the time, and that's fine. And, and your board doesn't expect that you get it right all the time. You just got to get, get like one or two to boost it, and then you can go from there. So I would argue that just maybe slightly contrarian, because I think this is an important topic. I discount the interview heavily, right? So if I were looking at someone I didn't know, um, I would weigh track record, yeah. 80 90%, and then the interview. An interview for me is an opportunity for someone to, to talk themselves out of a job, right? I'm, I'm, they're not, there's nothing they can say, or rarely they can say in the interview, that's going to overcome the body of work. So I'm really looking at the body of work, confirming it in the interview, allowing them to talk. But how talk do you look at what's? It. How do you look at the body of work? It's not just the resume. That's a longer discussion. Yeah, it's not yeah. just the resume. It's a big piece of it, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's. A, there's a lot of evidence there. Yeah. So uh, I've recently uh, allowed myself to believe that the right consultant can accelerate a new CEO's understanding of how this product market fit has to be put together. It's a, it's a very complicated puzzle. Uh, am, I, am I deluding myself in thinking that, that, that a good outside advisor can help, can accelerate the CEO's learning? Or is it just like Lucas said, you got to spend two years figuring it out on your own? Isn't the, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But in the search business, you're mostly buying companies that have some product market fit, right? Yeah. So I, I guess I don't really understand the question. Are you, buy, are, are you buying a, a company that does not have product market fit and you're searching for it? Well, I, I think what- God bless you if you're doing that. That's, that seems like- What, I think, <laughs> what I think happens is we're often buying companies where the, the seller yeah. was the chief sales rep. And he, 
through sheer force of personality, landed lots of deals. And as, as he landed more deals, he had to manage the management job encroached on his selling ability, so he hit a plateau. So there really aren't any training manuals. There really aren't right, right, right. any scripts. There aren't any decent compensation plans. Yeah, but that to me sounds, and again, in the time we have, hard to really get to the core of that. But if you tell me that someone has a business where they have successfully sold many, many customers, that tells me there's some product market fit there, right? Even if the sales rep is, or if the, the former owner is a bit of a force of nature, that only goes so far. Uh, if, so what you would look at there is, did the early customers stick with the product or service? And if they did, there's probably good product market fit there, or at least there's some uh, core of strong product market fit. What you're talking about is how do, you, how do you capture what that previous owner did? What motions did he go through to successfully land new customers? And you have to extract that out of his or her brain and, and replicate it. Uh, I'm not sure it's a product market fit question. Yeah, yeah I, just yeah. to follow up on that. The, the, the common pattern that we see is that the, the guy that's selling the business has kind of run out of gas, either because he's taken on other management roles or he's just gotten older, right? And so he's been maximizing it, the profitability. And so we're buying the business. And the two fundamental risks from an investor standpoint you're taking are one, management transition, and two, um, can you re-inject growth into the business? You're using these mechanisms that you're talking about. So yeah, there's a product market fit, but the company's not growing anything that's acceptable to the investors to get a good return. So what we have to figure out is how do these young people uh, who have come into this business, uh, you know, begin to put together a professional sales force that probably isn't in this company, right? And so yeah, there's a product market fit, but the question is, <laughs> is it too small? You know, is what too small? How does he expand the, the value proposition of the, the product market? Well, it may not be. I mean, I'll defer to Lucas on this. But in many cases, it's again, this is this is so subject to the specifics of the company, right? But in many cases, the product market fit is there. Yeah, that's right. And it's about uh, changing the go-to-market model, that's right. uh, changing the the approach to marketing. Um, there's I a know that's number it. of changes. You're buying. You're generally buying a company that that has product market fit, but you're buying a company from an entrepreneur who is not a professional salesperson, um, and 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 some of the times that that growth that you're talking about, it could be distraction from the person, or it could be that we've reached the limit of his version of go to market, and you need to figure out what the new go to market's going to be. Yeah. I think that's the bigger question, and so it's less about. Um, it's more about understanding how you sell and how you want to deploy reps and how you want to compensate them and how you want to create focus. Um, and then, and, that, and, and a big part of that too is, you know, let's think about what the value proposition is, how you're going to market, otherwise we're just wasting time. So one, one way to think about this, whether it's a search fund or whether it's a venture-backed company, is I tend to get excited about, personally, for making investments in companies that are successful despite, them, despite themselves. In other words, I look at their go-to-market model and it's pretty bad, it's pretty broken, it's pretty junior varsity, but they're still doing really well. And so what that tells me is product market fit and is there and the value proposition is strong. And then you can do something about this other motion and really crank up the value of the company. Uh, that's been a reoccurring theme for me personally in terms of uh, my own investments. Yeah. Um, so product market fit is there, but one of the parameters of a search fund is like a lifestyle, right? The guy is not running it in exactly the same steam. So that lifestyle for however long, and you don't know exactly for how long, year, six months, or two years, would allow the product market fit to be not perfectly aligned as you want it to be. And the question that Jim was asking, which I, I hope I understood it right, was if you were to bring an outside consultant would it dilute your role as a CEO? And, and sort of, and I don't know if that was the question exactly, but, but did you, my, so my question then would be, you know, where do you see at all a value uh, of bringing an outside party to, to so seeing from a third party? Because, you know, as we, as, we heard, yeah, yeah. as we heard in the morning, like we are really busy and dealing with urgent stuff every day, every minute. 
And just sitting back and looking at it overall becomes really difficult. I, uh, my, yeah, and if I, it's a good point. My comment at the beginning wasn't that, um, wasn't like Donald Trump's ex acceptance speech, I alone can fix this. Do you remember that? It is that you need to be a part of that process and you need to understand it. But you should seek advice from anyone you think will give you a better answer. And for us, it wasn't necessarily an outside consultant, and I'm not averse to that. If you think the person's smart, I just wouldn't. You'd have to have a pretty good reference checking process because this is going to be a lot of time and energy at a very critical time for your business. Um, but for us, I mean, it was we're in a very supportive community. Um, we reached out to a bunch of different people and said, how did you do this? How did you think about it? We talked to our board, talked to investors. I mean, we reached out to a bunch of different people. Example, I think about it. There's nothing personal about it, right? So what is better than people saying, get a coach? Oh, no, that's right. So if, if, if you can get a sales coach that's a good sales coach, do it, especially early. But you've got to make sure they're a good coach. Otherwise, you're just going to be ingraining bad habits up front. The other thing you need to be careful about is advice is cheap and easy, right? And you have to figure out a way to get, if you're going to get advice, you have to get someone, um, get their hands dirty in the business so they under, understand some of the nuances of it. Yeah. So otherwise, you get, you know, you see this in boards all the time. It's the... It's the cheap pattern matching. It's the, it's the throwaway advice. You know, I always tell my students, I teach this formation class in the fall with Mark Leslie. Uh, you know, if you listen to your board all the time, you will guaranteed to get, you're guaranteed to get fired, right? You just can't, you know, the board has so much advice, you just can't follow all of it. <laughs> and they're not close enough to the day to day to have that nuance of the business. So you should listen to it, but not follow all of it. If you're gonna find a coach or an advisor or a board member, that you really want to get operational advice from, you have to give them the opportunity and demand from them uh, that they get their hands dirty in the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, two, two questions, one's very simple. Um, for those of us who didn't take the course of the GSB, are there books, courses, <laughs> recommendations that you would? There's a course would? of the GSB. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming I'm past that. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything that you would recommend that, that covers this material or, or something there about? Um, so it's a great question, and I don't have a good answer for you. I wish I did. Second question is around, uh, <laughs> are there any sales strategies that you would like to talk about for sort of mid-tier pricing uh, products? We sell a product that is uh, about $50,000 average ticket size. It's a little too small for hunter killers to be out there uh, hammering the phones all the time. With new business, it's a little too expensive for uh, the direct oh. internet-based method. Good question. I'd have You're to in that. that. I mean, I'd, yeah, it's... I'd have to know a lot more. Our ARPU is 6K, so we're, our average customer is 75K a year. But we have, you know, $2 million, $3 million customers, and we have $10,000 customers. We have a long tail. I'd have to know a lot more about your specific situation. It's, it's uh, enterprise software. So, but pricing starts not, you, you don't price your product based on what your go-to-market model is, right? It's the other way around. You have to figure out, you know, pricing is based on the strength of the value proposition, the competitive landscape, you know, all these, all these other uh, your costs. factors. And then you have to figure out what the right go-to-market model is. And as I said, sometimes there's a disconnect. You know, you, if you're at 50K but you require... Uh, you know, a $300,000 field salesperson with a systems engineer and blah, 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 right? That you, yeah, that doesn't work. Then it doesn't work unless your deal velocity is high enough, right? So as an example, I had a dilemma. Again, I'll go back to the VMware example. Um, our average deal size was 10K, but it was an evangelical sell. Imagine you go to a customer and you say, hey, we got this great thing. Uh, you put it on your, on your server, and then an operating system sits on top of that, and then an application sits on top of that. But Microsoft, the operating system vendors don't support it, and the, and the application vendors don't support it. So if something goes wrong, you're kind of on your own. Right? So it was an evangelical <laughs> sell for 10K. But we were primarily direct. We had our average sales rep OTE was probably two and a quarter. So how do you make that, how do you square that circle? Well, you do a shitload of deals. That's how you work, that's how you do it. And so we averaged um, a million two a quarter, 
productivity per sales rep. So the answer to the, so th there's all these rules of thumb, like if you're going to hire a direct sales organization, the deal has to be greater than 100K. And that's generally the case, but not always the case. If at 50K, I could argue there's a lot of deals, uh, a lot of products or services you could sell for 50K over the phone. So I'm not convinced that that has to be a field model. Nor am I convinced it has to be 100K. It's in the devil's in the details. Uh, I've seen both ends of the spectrum, so. In the back. Um, you suggest in the last panel that when hiring, you can be industry agnostic. So, for example, when looking at your sales team, let's say you're a searcher, you've acquired the company, you're looking to ramp up the sales team, uh, can I house, hire a sales team from any industry, or should it be specifically the industry of the Let business? Let me ask you a question. If you're, um, if, if you're going to go sell lasers to the Department of Defense, do you think you have to have any domain, yeah, yeah. domain expertise? Okay. Uh, if you're a startup in the storage space, for example, do you want your first salesperson to have storage background? I would, I would say absolutely. So the way you have to think about this is, is it's not one size fits all. The more complex the product or the market that you're selling into or the more arcane it is, the more uh, domain expert expertise is important. One of my previous companies, we sold into healthcare. And if you weren't conversant in uh, Medicare Part B and, and all the regulations that go and, and how the relationships between pro, you know, providers and payers and, and customers are, you couldn't get past the first conversation. And that's not something you can train in an afternoon. So, but when you get larger and you, ha you can build the training and development infrastructure, then you can start to take people from outside of, of the industry. Now, conversely, if I'm Dropbox, I don't care who I'm, what industry I'm hiring from because the product's so simple, I can train anybody in an afternoon, right? So you have to look on that spectrum between product complexity, uh, market complexity, compet you know, competitive landscape, you know, from simple to, you know, from Dropbox to SAP, uh, <laughs> my answer to that question is going to vary dramatically. And I also sense? think as a searcher um, or as a search fund operator, oftentimes you have to be careful that the industry, that in the hiring process, the industry experience uh, blinds you to uh, deficiencies mm. in sales ability. So mm. I made the mistake of hiring people I thought were good because they already knew the words I was talking about, but they weren't good at sales. So... I would say it's always better in this form, it's always better to get good salespeople from your industry, but you, it's a careful balance you have to look out for. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not either or, right? Yeah. Can you, uh, my question is on lead generation. You mentioned the SDR. My favorite topic. Yeah. I, you lo I love good, the whole concept around, around funnel building and lead generation. Can you, can you, in that case, can you give us an if then? You mentioned the SDRs may not be the right uh, kind of hammer for the nail. Can you give us an, how should we think about the if then? Do you have a SaaS right? business? No. Well, I'm an investor, so yes, we have some SaaS businesses. <laughs> yeah. you, you can give <laughs> a case study businesses. if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but I, I could, you know, I've, I've been flashed the card that says we only had a couple minutes left, so uh, I'll keep it really short and we could catch up later on this. The big challenge, I think, in some businesses is that um, the hardest part of the sales cycle is what? What's the hardest part of the sales cycle? It's a rhetorical Prospecting. question. Prospecting. It's prospecting. You don't have to think hard. If you do everything else right, closing the deal is the easiest part of the sales cycle. If you have product market fit and a strong value proposition and you go through your stages of the sales cycle, if you do them right, you're going to get the deal, right, by and large. Uh, the hardest part is the prospecting, is getting people to think about you differently than the thousand other people who are trying to sell them something uh, in the same period of time, competing for the same budget, Differen differentiating themselves and getting your attention and getting budget. That's the hardest part of the job. So who do we put on it? Let's take the cheapest, least experienced person. Let's put them on that job. Does that make any sense to you? Essentially, SDRs to me in many cases are a function of salespeople not wanting to prospect. And, and so not to be too negative, I think if you're, in a, if you're in a business that is largely inbound, right, no brainer. You need someone to sort through the chaff and figure out the real deals and not waste time on, on non-qualified opportunities. So that's kind of a no brainer. The more transactional the business is, the more it makes sense to have SDRs, right? 5K, 10K kind of makes sense, right? Where you're doing a high volume of deals because price is a proxy for complexity. So now we're, 
we're on the lower end of the complexity scale. Uh, so putting someone that's young and hungry and 23 and less experienced doesn't worry me and they can do more volume. I love the co-location of people together and the learning dynamic that that entails and the fast uh, uh, learning cycle for the business. I love all of that. As you move towards more outbound, more complexity, qualifying in versus qualifying out, I would argue that more of the funnel ne build needs to fall on the shoulder of, of, of experienced salespeople. The more evangelical the sale is, the more it needs to fall on, on the shoulders of the salespeople. If you're selling something, again, I go back to the VMware days. If I were an SDR and I called you up and said, listen, what's your budget for virtualization? And you're like, what I mean, what's that? We don't have a budget for that, right? The, the SDRs, in, their job is to qualify in many cases. Do you have a budget? Do you have a project? You know, you get all those no's and okay, right? So the, uh, the sales rep's job is to say, well, do we have a budget for server consolidation maybe? Or have you thought about the value proposition of eliminating three data centers and turning it into one? Like, can on we now. talk about that with your executive team? And that's a sales rep's job, not an SDR's job. So you know, there's a lot more there, right? Right, okay.